Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spirit and Truth Podcast. If you're wondering about the opening and closing uh, song, um, those are songs that are written and sung by Jennifer Johnson. Um, She is a uh, Christian, of course, gifted uh, vocalist and songwriter, and she lives here in Los Angeles. And she's also a uh, good friend of our uh, fellowship. If uh, you like her song, she's on iTunes. The name of this particular song is uh, I Am Elijah. And I think she has two singles on iTunes, so you can listen to her. We're going to be interviewing her and her new husband. Actually, not new husband. I think they've been married a year now. And um, we're going to be interviewing them on the podcast pretty soon. So look forward to that. Um, With that said, let's uh, open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could come together with technology and everything that goes with it. And of course, the fellowship of the body of believers all over the world, Lord. We thank you for our listeners now who we recently discovered are all the way in South Africa, in Mexico, uh, Sweden, of course, the UK, of course, and of course, the United States. And now we get word that the Carringtons are listening from um, Turkey. And so, Lord, it's exciting to see what you're doing, even not knowing where the whole thing is finally going to go. But uh, we follow you just the same. We follow you by faith. We follow you according to your word, Lord, that enlightens us. And so we want to say thank you. We want to jo- you want to ask you to join in with us, Lord, of course, because without you, without your word, <coughs> we are nothing. Um, Father, we pray that you would anoint each one of us with a spiritual sense of being able to listen, to uh, obtain, Father, we pray for soft hearts, uh, ears that can hear, eyes that can see. We pray for minds that are totally transformed by and according to your word, Lord. Have your way now in, uh, in this session, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Let me just start out by saying, by thanking the listeners, actually. Thank you all for joining. Um, Of course, uh, you know, if you have any questions and if you're a member of our group on Facebook, uh, ask the questions or if you have comments, put them on there. And uh, I'm sure that myself and some of the other members of the group uh, would like to hear and would like to read, I should say, and will respond in like. Um, If you're not a member, of course, you can always uh, email me. Uh, Mario J Zam at AOL.com. That's M A R I O J Z A M at AOL.com. Um, I say that because, you know, studying the Bible can be like putting a puzzle together. You know, every time you uh, get a piece and it comes together with the other pieces, man, there's this sense of joy, there's a sense of hope, uh, even satisfaction. And, uh, and and confidence, or what the Bible calls uh, faith. And so I just want to encourage you guys to take a half hour out of your week to listen to the podcast and to be challenged to grow and mature spiritually um, as we study uh, the Word of God, which is actually the mind and the heart of God uh, in and through the, the Scriptures. And it's interesting because as the puzzle comes together, Um, You see Jesus on one side of the puzzle and you see yourself on the other. 
And so, again, I just want to make myself uh, available to any questions you might have. Um, but I can assure you that as we continue to go through the Bible, you are going to understand more and more about uh, wonderful things, um, things that are so deep, uh, words can hardly describe them. But it takes consistency. You'll have to invest your mind, your spirit, your heart uh, into it. And so um, we look forward to uh, doing that and being a part of uh, your uh, your growth as, as we continue on. Um, this week, we're going to go through uh, Genesis chapter 1, of course, which is where we've been. But we're going to go through verses 3 down to uh, 19. And we're going to be talking about the light, the light. And before we talk about the light, let me just mention that uh, in this first chapter of Genesis, from chapter, uh, from verses 3 to 31, that's a total of 26 verses, seven times we read that God looked at what he created and said, it was good. And in verse 31, at the closing of the chapter, he even goes on to say that it was very good. I mention that because as a pastor, I visit lots and lots of people uh, in hospitals, uh, in marital situations, where there is just so much crisis. Um, there's a young man who... Um, Recently, I mean, he's not even 25 years old, and I uh, found out that he had cancer. He had a tumor, and he had that removed. Um, another very good friend of mine who was in recovery um, began drinking again. I went to visit with him in the hospital. In less than five days, he drank so much that he developed uh, pancreatitis, I think is what it's called, where you're uh, pancreas just swells up. It becomes so inflamed that it just gave out and he just fell down in a moment. He's a big, strong guy, man. But we all know that uh, alcohol can be just too much for us when it's taken to that capacity. And um, another young man whose father uh, has cancer, terminal cancer. Um, his father and his mother aren't married. They wanted to get married uh, before dad uh, died of cancer and the son is just totally uh, perplexed um, confused and he's asking you know how could God allow this and that's a question that is asked many times um, today uh, and people actually come to the place where they can blame God for all the chaos in the world and they say you know if God loves us if there actually is a God why is there sickness and war and death and addiction and abortion and single parent homes and fatherless men in prison and all of those things? Why would God do this? Why does God allow this? But really, the question is really, who is really actually responsible? Well, we know from Genesis chapter 1, it's not God because we see what God created and what he intended. And he said it was very good. So God is surely not responsible for all of the chaos and sin in the world. Actually, <clears throat> the Bible tells us who is responsible in Genesis chapter 3. You'll see more in detail when uh, we get there. But we're told there that uh, it was actually the first people that God placed on earth, Adam and Eve, they were responsible because they chose sin over God's will. And when they did that, all the chaos we see in the world today was birthed. Um, and, you know, before we start taking their inventory and call judgment on Adam and Eve, uh, we have to be honest uh, and admit that people are still making the same choices today, just like our ancestors. Um, and today they're experiencing all of the same chaos that came with uh, Adam and Eve or that came at the same time that Adam and Eve made the same choice that uh, that we do today, actually. And so I don't think we have to elaborate too much on all this stuff. We see it all around us. And the more we read our Bible, the clearer it all becomes. But with that said, um, let us also remember that the Bible does not leave us without hope. 
John 3.16 says that our God so loved the world, and not the world, not earth itself, but the people. God so loved the people of the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus, the Son of God, said, I am the light of the world. And that's what we're going to talk about today um, in this podcast. Um, because if we understand that the Bible is prophetic, um, and let me elaborate on that just a moment. In our minds, in the Western mind, in the Gentile mind, prophecy is something spoken and something that comes to pass. We have a very linear way of thinking. But in the Hebrew, in the ancient Jewish mind, what they understand about prophecy is that prophecy is spoken and then it becomes a pattern all throughout the history of the world and even today and even in the future. And so if we can understand that, then when we get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, we can see a great light of hope. And let's go ahead and jump in, and you'll see, hopefully, uh, what I mean. And again, remember, if you have any questions, put them out there on Facebook if you're a member of the group, or you can email me, and I'll give you my email address again um, after we're done here. But if you turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it's the first book of the Bible, it says, Then, that's after verses 1 and 2, we talked about that last week, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Well, from verses 3 to 31, you'll see that as we go through the podcast today and next week. God speaks life into the world and into the heavens. And He begins with, He starts with light. When we came to believe that God is who the Bible says He is. And when we came to that place where we turned our will and our life over to Him, where we said the sinner's prayer, confessed with our mouth and believed in our heart, the first thing that God did, that God wanted to do, that God intended to do, was to turn on the light on your life. You say, well, how does He do that? Well, prophecy, remember? He does that the same way He did it in Genesis chapter 1, through the power of His Word. God's Word is the most powerful thing on earth. And we see that as we go through the Bible, and you'll see it as we journey our way through. But what happens is we read the Bible, and God speaks to us. When we do that, we begin to see the reality of sin and chaos in our life, and we experience the loving conviction, not condemnation. This is where a lot of people run. We experience the loving conviction of our Father. Let me elaborate on that for just a minute. When the Bible speaks of conviction, it speaks of God's method of correction to His people. When the Bible speaks of condemnation, it speaks of what Satan offers those people who are not saved. Because Satan, all throughout the Bible, condemns, but God convicts. And all conviction is really is evidence of God's Spirit in our life. So condemnation, at the same time, is evidence of the absence of God's Spirit in our life. But the fact is that once the power of God's Word speaks life or light into us, life takes on a new meaning, a new direction. And we begin to experience true freedom. Not the freedom the world talks about or other people talk about. I'm talking about an eternal, biblical, true freedom. And, of course, a present and eternal hope 
and peace and satisfaction that's really beyond measure, that's really beyond what words can describe. Because what happens is when we get saved, when we come to believe, when we turn our lives over to God, um, the living light goes on. And so, you know, if you're familiar with uh, the 12-step recovery, um, you might have the advantage of understanding what we're talking about here. And and that's not to say that if you're not part of a 12-step recovery group, you don't. We're going to get to that in a minute. But see if maybe we can simplify by looking at the first uh, five steps. In step one, um, we abandon chaos. In a nutshell, that's what we're doing. In step two, it's pretty cut and dry. We come to believe. In step three, we offer Jesus Christ our will and our life. That is, if we're going to offer our will and our life over to the care of what the Bible says is the one and only true God. And then, of course, in step four, we get a panoramic view of uh, the light and the darkness in our life. It's where we do our inventory and we write out and we review it. And we can see the difference between light and darkness at certain stages of our life. And then, of course, in step five, what do we do? We expose it as we share it with God and another human being. And, and, you know, let me read here um, just a couple of New Testament uh, scriptures that explains what I'm talking about further. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, it says, We were once darkness, step one. But now you are light in the Lord, step two. Step three, walk as children of light. Verse nine says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That's step four. And then it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And now the fifth step, but rather expose them. And so if you're in recovery and you choose to memorize those verses, you'll find that over just a short period of time, your step work is going to be taken to a whole new level. Well, um, continuing on in verse 6, um, We read, then God said, let there be a firmament, that is a space or a canopy or a vault in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the earth. Thus, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. So we're going to take a quick break here from the issue of light. We'll come back to that. But we're going to talk about the water. Because we want to go in the order that God wrote uh, the book of Genesis here. Or gave it to us, I should say. So it says here that there was water on the earth. That is, there were springs, there were rivers and oceans and probably lakes. And there was a firmament or a water vault or a water canopy of moisture above the earth. So there was this circle of moisture that covered the whole earth. Now... Scholars, um, scientists, those people that are really uh, in the know, they say that this water canopy that did exist at one time protected the earth from ultraviolet rays and that that because of that, um, it was able to sustain a consistent climate over the whole earth. So the whole earth had one weather pattern uh, throughout. And it was one temperature because of this canopy. They also say that the canopy is the reason we find tropical plants today under all of the ice in the North and South Poles. And I would imagine now that the ice is melting a little bit because there are seasons like that throughout world history where 
the earth gets a little warmer, and then it goes back to being cool and like that. I would imagine that at this point, they're starting to find, again, some of those tropical plants that are buried under the ice that are, were there for thousands of years. And that, of course, is evidence of the existence of this canopy. The other thing they say about this canopy is that it was the reason that people lived so long before the flood uh, of Noah that the Bible mentions in chapter 7. Um, and what happened in chapter 7 when the flood came is that this water canopy actually collapsed and the springs of water under the earth broke open and that, of course, caused the whole earth uh, to flood. Now, when we talk about the whole earth being flooded, it, it's difficult to wrap our minds around it, even though there's all kinds of evidence of this. There's a good Christian brother of mine that uh, argues this all the time. He says it was not a, a, a earth or a worldwide flood. And we, we go back and forth on it. And, um, you know, you might wrestle with it a little bit. But one thing for sure is that almost every ancient civilization has their own account of this worldwide flood. They may argue about how it happened, how it was caused, why it came and all of that. But one thing that they don't deny is that it happened. And we're going all the way back to the Mesopotamians, the ancient Greeks, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Mayans, the Native Americans, those um, aboriginal uh, tribes in, in Australia. They all believe that the earth was flooded about 7,000 years ago. And so one thing for sure, um, from the time of Genesis chapter 7, there is no more canopy of water. Um, there are different weather patterns all around the earth at any given time. And people are living much shorter lives. You're going to see that as we get closer and closer to Genesis chapter 7 and the um, chapters after that as well. And, you know, one of the things kind of silly, but it's true. Today we've got to wear sunglasses and sunscreen when we go outside, um, which is just more evidence that that canopy is not there to protect us um, anymore. Well, getting back to the light now. Let's go uh, move on to verse 14, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. It says, uh, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, we call that the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, we call that the moon. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Well, we know that the greater light is the sun and the lesser light is the moon that only reflects the sun. And again, this speaks prophetically of our relationship with the sun. Not the sun that is in the, in the, in the firmaments, but the sun, S-O-N, Jesus Christ. And so let, let me explain this. Um, hopefully I can do a good job. If not... You can listen. That's the advantage you have. You can listen to the podcast over and over again. Or you can uh, email me and say, Mario, you didn't do a very good job with this at all. Please explain further. And, and listen, I'm not perfect. I'm not the best teacher in the world, but I'd be more than happy to do that. Or, of course, you can mention that on, on Facebook as well. But let me explain. We all know, if you went to school even to the fourth grade, that the sun is a giant ball that produces a great light. In fact, they say that if the world was just a few miles closer to the sun, that uh, the earth would melt. And by a few mi miles closer, I mean, you know, maybe by 100,000 miles or whatever. I'm not a scientist, so I don't know all the particulars. But the moon is different. The moon is, is of course, smaller, and it produces no light of its own. So the earth, the sun, I should say, produces light. The moon can produce zero light. But in the evening, the moon is able to receive light from the sun and it reflects that light onto the world in the evening. So speaking prophetically now, prophecy is a pattern, remember. 
in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19, what we just read, speaks of what God did physically thousands of years ago when he created the sun and the moon, the greater light and the lesser light. But it also speaks spiritually of what he is doing in our lives today. Let's make the comparison. Anybody knows that in the evening you can look up at the moon and the moon is reflecting the sun's light to one degree or another. And so if you look up and you see a quarter moon, then it's a quarter light. If it's a half moon, it's a half light. Three quarter moon, it's a three quarter light. Um, I say that because uh, the moon does not actually disappear or portions of it don't disappear. That's not why you get a quarter moon, half moon, or three quarter moon. The reason you get that portion of moon is because that portion of the moon is lit up. The rest of the moon is there, but it's dark. And so sometimes we can even see a full moon. And other times the moon reflects, as you know, no light at all. Well, on any given night, the amount of light that the moon reflects is determined by how much the earth, the world, comes between the sun and the moon. And so what is true physically of the moon is true spiritually of us. And that's what we call prophecy. And so from the Genesis, that is the beginning, we talked about that um, when we were in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. From the beginning, from the Genesis, Jesus Christ has been the Son of God. Not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N of God. And He has been the source of light and life. And you can even say love. In other words, without Jesus Christ, from the time of the beginning to now, there would be no light, there would be no life, and there would be no love. Man cannot produce love in and of itself. Real love, as God defines real love, can only come from the throne of God. And that's true with light, and I want to stick with that because that's what we're talking about here, the light of God. So if you go to the New Testament to confirm what I just said, and you go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says this, the New Testament now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We're talking about a person now. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. Difficult to wrap our minds around this, but Jesus Christ is the Word. So that Word that was spoken in Genesis chapter 1 that creates all of these things, that Word is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was not only present, but He was the power that created. And nothing that was created was created without Him. So He's the architect of all things. And in him, it said, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. So he is truly the light. And so from the beginning, Jesus Christ has been and always will be the Son of God and the source of all light and life. And how much his life and light will reflect in your personal life will depend on how much the world gets between you and Him. Let me repeat that. How much light and life of Jesus Christ that will reflect in your life will depend on how much the world gets between you and Him, just like the sun and the moon and the earth. And so the whole reason God gave His Son to... Um, to to the world, to the people of the world. Let me repeat that. The whole reason God gave His only begotten Son 
was so that, or to the world, was so that we could be in direct, loving relationship with Him without this sinful world getting in the way. Now, I love plants. I love animals. I, Man, I'm out in the sun. I look at the trees and all kinds of life forms. And I say, oh my goodness, how beautiful the day is. I'm about to go enjoy the day after we're done here, for sure. But I look at all of those things, and, and they're wonderful. But make no mistake about it, sin goes hand in hand with the world. The world is a sinful place. And... um. Again, the whole reason God gave His only begotten Son was so that we could be in direct, loving relationship without Him, without this sinful world getting in the way. In other words, we put the Word of God first. Yes, we've got to live in this world, but the Bible says we should not be a part of it. The Bible, I believe in the book of Philippians, it says that we're not even citizens of this world. We're just passing through. We are citizens of heaven through the work of Jesus Christ. And you know, in closing, let me say that if you're in recovery, I believe the reason God allowed the 12 steps to be taken from the Bible, and if you don't know that, uh, let me know. There's a book out of a gentleman that Pastor Raymond and I um, have had the privilege to meet. He wrote 40 books on the subject, but he gives all the evidence in the world as he went throughout the history of the 12-step programs and like that, that the the, the 12 steps came from the Bible. Actually, uh, the, the person who helped uh, put all of that together was Pastor Sam Shoemaker way back in the 30s. But um, the reason God allowed the 12 steps to be taken from the Bible, I believe, was to help us recognize and eliminate the sin or, or the character defects or the shortcomings that we have that have been the obstacles, I should say, between us and God until now. Those things have been the obstacles that have kept us or that have come between us and God and that have kept us from His Word and His life for so long. And so if God has brought you to himself through the process of the 12 says, man, keep that in mind. What a great blessing they've been to those of us who, myself included, who went to church and, and early on tried to understand or see God through that. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. But then we found the 12 step fellowship. We thought that we went there for drugs or alcohol or gambling or pornography or whatever it was. We thought that we got there for that. We thought that all we wanted to do was eliminate that in our lives. And we find out, oh no, there's 12 steps that speak of God that will help us if we apply them to remove those obstacles that come between us and God and his word. And then, lo and behold, we're in a loving relationship with Him because we move forward to understand Him through the power of His Word. And through the power of His Word, He breathes life and light into our lives the same way He did in Genesis chapter 1 with the world and the heavens. Well, that's all the time. Man, time goes by so fast when I'm doing this. That's all the time we have for this podcast. You know, as they say in recovery meetings, man, keep coming back because next week we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, verses 20 to 31, talking about the creation of the animals and uh, animals in the sea and on land. And of course, the crown of God's creation, which is mankind. And the most important thing we're going to talk about next week is the fact that we were created in the image of God. And so, again, if you're a member of the Spirit and Truth uh, Facebook group, feel free to um, comment or ask questions there or request prayer also. And if you're not a member and don't want to be for whatever reason, you can just email me at mariojzam at aol.com and I'll be glad to do uh, the same through email. And lastly, let me just mention in closing, um, go ahead and look forward to the next Israel uh, tour that Our How Travel, um, which is Pastor Raymond and I are putting together. And we ask you that you please be patient because we're working to get the best accommodations for the best price at the best time of the year and all of that. And so if you get a chance, check out the photos of our January tour at www.rhowsc.org. God bless you and keep you throughout the week. Amen.